According to the ancient myths, the gods themselves lived here. On the summit of misty Mount Olympus in northern Greece. But it is no myth that the Greeks once towered godlike over all the arts and sciences. The voices from the golden age of Greece still seem to echo through these ruins. I am Plato. Along with Socrates, I made thinking a way of life, founding the discipline of philosophy. I am Aristotle, originator of the scientific method. I am Solon, who framed the laws of Athens and hence gave the world democracy. I am Aeschylus, originator of the drama. With Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, I wrote plays which filled these great theaters. I am Demetrius, discus thrower. I entered this gate to compete in the original Olympic Games. Here were the greatest athletes of Greece vied with each other to win a crown of laurel leaves. But alongside the ancient ruins which testify to the rich past of Greece, impoverished farmers now try to scratch out a poor living in the worn, rocky soil. Along the coasts, fishermen net pitifully small catches from the heavily fished waters. Greece, then, is a nation rich in culture and history, but poor in resources and modern technology. In this film, we will examine this rich, poor land, learn how its citizens make a living, and try to discover what promise this country offers its people for a better way of life in the future. The Kingdom of Greece thrusts southward into the eastern Mediterranean between the Ionian and Aegean seas. It is composed of a mountainous peninsula, which is divided into northern Greece and a southern section, called the Peloponnesus, by the Corinthian Canal. This canal serves as a shortcut through the peninsula and helps link the more than 4,000 islands encircling the peninsula. In total area, Greece is smaller than the state of Illinois. Its population is approximately 9 million. Because of the international shipping lanes which crisscross Greece, Athens, the capital, and its adjacent port city of Piraeus have long formed an important center of Mediterranean trade and finance. Nearly 2 million people live in this sprawling metropolitan area. The Parthenon, probably the most copied building of all time, crowns the Acropolis, with Athens at its feet. Clinging to the slopes of the Acropolis are incredibly old dwellings crowded together on narrow, twisting streets, where in tiny shops, artisans pursue crafts for which Greeks have been noted since antiquity, shaping pottery in the classic forms, decorating their art with motifs identical with those found on objects dug up from the past. The past is itself an important commodity to the Greeks because it helps to draw thousands of tourists to their country each year. But many foreign visitors who come to see the ruins find the dry, mild Mediterranean climate so pleasant that they return to Greece again and again. Athens is the center of this tourist activity, but tourism is spreading throughout the country. Today, the money spent in Greece by visitors is one of the major sources of income for the nation. Modern Athens has grown up within and around the old city. Today's Athenians look busy and prosperous, and indeed, these city dwellers are more fortunate than many Greeks living outside Athens. The central business district is modern and jammed with heavy traffic. Here in the largest urban area, Athens and Piraeus, one might easily believe that the golden age of Greece still exists and that it remains a rich and powerful nation. 
that Greece is poor in most of the natural resources needed to build a strong industrial nation, there are no large proven deposits of coal or oil. So Athens and the other industrial cities must depend upon hydroelectric power from the swift, shallow rivers. Most of the vast hydroelectric potential of Greece has not yet been developed, however. The country does have deposits of limestone, marble, limited amounts of iron ore, and significant pockets of bauxite, which Greece is just beginning to develop into an aluminum industry. Many enterprises in the athens Piraeus area are based on local resources. This plant uses nearby limestone for making cement. Although useful for local construction, cement is too heavy and too cheap to be a profitable export item. Fine Greek marble, however, is valuable enough to be sold to countries thousands of miles away. A far newer Athens industry is this mill, which smelts most of the country's limited iron ore into steel. Much of its steel output is used in the shipyards of Piraeus, but since steel production is inadequate, the Greeks cannot build all the ships they need. Because of Greece's dependence on trade, she must maintain one of the world's larger merchant fleets. The harbor at Piraeus is jammed with trade vessels the year round because Greece must constantly import food, raw materials, and most of the manufactured goods she needs. Balancing her imports as best she can with exports of agricultural specialties, such as olive oil, wine, and dried fruits. This large-scale maritime activity has made Piraeus the center of both island and international shipping in Greece. The country's other major port and industrial center is Salonika, which lies at the mouth of the Vardar River Valley. Salonika handles much of the shipping for all of southeastern Europe and is the terminus for four railways, making it the hub of communications between Europe and Asia. As the chief city of northern Greece, Salonika is not only an important commercial, industrial, and agricultural center, but also a melting pot for many nationalities and cultures. Byzantine architecture is a reminder of the centuries of Turkish rule imposed on northern Greece. Today, the people of Salonika and the surrounding area cannot forget the conflict between Turkey and Greece, but the residents of Greek ancestry and those from the Near East try to live together in peace. The University of Salonika helps train and increase the number of skilled technicians for such developing industries as newly constructed oil refineries, which process crude oil imported from the Near East on Greek tanker ships. Other factories assemble imported metal parts into desperately needed machinery with which Greece can continue to build. Although these new factories are encouraging, they are the exception rather than the rule. There is little modern industry outside of Athens, Piraeus, and Salonika. A much more typical Greek occupation is fishing. There are fishing villages along the winding coastline of the peninsula and on the shores of some of the islands. Only a few of Greece's thousands of islands are inhabited. These include the Cyclades, Corfu, the Dodecanese, Crete, and Euboea. In both the island and mainland fishing villages, Greek fishermen tend their nets much as their ancestors did centuries earlier. Many fishermen equip their tiny craft with twin tail lanterns to make it safer and more convenient to get home when fishing after dark. Their catch is likely to be small, for the Greek fisherman must make his living in seas that probably were overfished a thousand years ago.
The fishermen and other island residents are rather isolated because most of the islands can be reached only by boat. In many of their whitewashed villages, motorized equipment is practically non-existent. Supplies, whether bricks or bread, are unloaded by hand and carried away on the backs of burrows. Islanders live in unhurried seclusion in their steep streeted villages, which seem attractive to visitors seeking a change of pace from the modern world. Many of the Grecian Isles are actually the tops of submerged mountains, which belong to the same rugged range that extends from northern Greece, southward through the Peloponnesus, and finally into the Aegean Sea. In this mountainous area of the mainland, the face of Greece is scarred with gullies from erosion. The land is too steep and the soil too poor to support anything except the goat herds which roam the slopes. Even goats grow gaunt on such poor pasture and provide but a poor living for the herdsmen. This poor land, poor living cycle has gone unbroken for centuries. So Greece still offers some of her people no better way of life than was typical when the women gathered at the well in biblical times. Most farm villages in the remote highlands are small and unmechanized. The highland farmers walk narrow paths between their fields and their villages. Very few paved roads cross the mountains because highway construction is extremely expensive in this rugged terrain. Although well over half the people in Greece are farmers, only a small percentage of them live here in the barren highlands. Most farmers crowd into the more productive but narrow strips of coastal lowland or in the fertile river valleys. The lowlands of the Peloponnesus are cut up into many small farms worked by individual farmers who specialize in the traditional crops which flourish around the Mediterranean. Vineyards supplying grapes for currants and wine, and tree crops such as olives, figs and dates, and citrus fruits, lemons, oranges, and limes, which are favorites in Greek markets as well as in her markets abroad. Gradually, the primitive farming methods used for centuries along the coastal plains are giving way to new tools and new methods. But the Greek farmer's wife, who works side by side with her husband, still goes about doing her chores in the old, back-breaking ways. Her duties include tending the family's farm animals, usually a few sheep and goats. In the river valleys of Peloponnesus, farmers concentrate on vineyards and grain crops. But the fields are usually only a few acres in size and worked by hand with primitive tools. The plains of Thessaly in northern Greece provide one of the few areas where larger farms are possible, one of the few areas of extensive lowlands in mountainous Greece. Yet the small village, small farm pattern still is prominent on the plains of Thessaly. Each day, the small herds of goats are driven out to pasture. And the housewife still bakes out of doors in a whitewashed wood-burning oven, shaping the characteristic thick-crusted Greek loaves of bread. After their sunup to sundown day of laboring in the fields, the farmers return home to few comforts and fewer luxuries. Nevertheless, Greek home life glows with warmth. In this, at least, the Greeks are rich.
Perhaps these strong family ties have kept the older Greeks close to their small fields. But more and more, the young people are moving out, leaving the villages deserted. In order to break these chains of poverty, school attendance is now required for all youngsters between the ages of 7 and 16. And those who are training the next generation believe that changes are on the way in Greece. I am Stefanos Papandreou. When I teach geography, I tell my students about the new world. But I also try to tell them that they can build a new world in Greece. With irrigation, petrofertilizers, and mechanized farm equipment, the limited tillable acres could be made more productive. We need to improve our ways of growing crops, such as tobacco, perhaps finding ways to eliminate so much backbreaking hand work. We might find new uses for our cash crops, such as olives. Our ancient olive groves are beautiful, but perhaps they should be replaced with newer, more productive varieties of olives. Surely we can find more efficient ways to handle the olive crops so that we use our resources and manpower more effectively. Consider how we might develop the wool industry, for example. We might well do so by improving our pastures, improving our breeds of sheep, and improving our methods of handling wool. But so far, Greece clings largely to the old ways. We cannot and will not build a great textile industry as long as most of the spinning is done in the fields. It is up to you to build the new Greece, I tell my students, and I believe they will. The ancestors of these youngsters paved the way for Western civilization. If they're willing to work, these young people can begin to share in more of the benefits of that civilization. Improvements are on the way in Greece. In the Vardar Valley, for example, the Delta marshland deposited by the river is being drained to create new farmland. And irrigation systems are bringing precious water to previously dry, unproductive land. New roads will link the farmlands with the cities where modern apartments are being built for the city dwellers. And fine hotels erected to attract foreign visitors. Rich land, poor land. Greece is both. Poor in resources, in her degree of industrialization and in saleable products, but rich in her heritage. Rich in a history and tradition held in common by almost all the countries of the Western world. And rich in the climate and beauty of her land. Tourists come to Greece in ever-increasing numbers, eager, as her poet Sophocles once wrote, to return thence by the way speediest, where our beginnings are. We spied with each other to win a crown of laurel leaves. But alongside the ancient ruins which testify to the rich past of Greece, impoverished farmers now try to scratch out a poor living in the worn, rocky soil. Along the coasts, fishermen net pitifully small catches from the heavily fished waters. Greece, then, is a nation rich in culture and history, but poor in resources and modern technology. In this film, we will examine this rich, poor land, learn how its citizens make a living, and try to discover what promise this country offers its people for a better way of life in the future. The Kingdom of Greece thrusts southward into the eastern Mediterranean between the Ionian and Aegean seas. It is composing to the ancient myths. The gods themselves lived here. 
on the summit of misty Mount Olympus in northern Greece. But it is no myth that the Greeks once towered godlike over all the arts and sciences. The voices from the golden age of Greece still seem to echo through these ruins. I am Plato. Along with Socrates, I made thinking a way of life, founding the discipline of philosophy. I am Aristotle, originator of the scientific method. I am Solon, who framed the laws of Athens and hence gave the world democracy. I am Aeschylus, originator of the drama. With Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, I wrote plays which filled these great theaters. I am Demetrius, discus thrower. I entered this gate to compete in the original Olympic Games. Here were the greatest athletes of Greece. ...of a mountainous peninsula, which is divided into northern Greece and a southern section, called the Peloponnesus, by the Corinthian Canal. This canal serves as a shortcut through the peninsula and helps link the more than 4,000 islands encircling the peninsula. In total